Panoramas are the perfect way to share dramatic scenes like this, but they can also be tricky to stitch. So in this tutorial, I'll show you an amazing alternative to Lightroom that makes it easy to tackle tough jobs like this. First, a little background in Lightroom. I've got 15 images in total. What you're looking at are these individual frames. I shot this on a leveled panoramic tripod head where I've got a bottom row, and then I've got a middle row, and then I've got a top row to capture three rows of five each for a total of 15 images. Now each of these is shot with a 19 millimeter tilt shift lens. So I could have gotten a wider view with my 14 millimeter, but I never could have captured this entire scene with the 14. And on top of that, I wouldn't have had the high resolution that I'm able to get by merging all these as a panorama. So that's why I wanted the panorama. And I would have thought these would have merged okay. I don't have crazy amounts of motion frame to frame here. If you look at you know something like this pillar here, and look where it's moving, I wouldn't think it'd be a problem, but maybe it's too much motion. Maybe the tilt shift is a problem. I'm not sure what it is, but something about this sequence of images just gives Lightroom fits. So if I select everything, I'll show you what I mean. Right click, I go to photo merge, panorama. So I'm asking Lightroom to stitch these together into a panorama. And I'll just speed things up here because it's gonna take a minute. And you see it did spit out a result, but it's gibberish. I mean, look at the alignment here. It's just awful. I don't know what's going on, but this is not an acceptable result. And I would say more than half the time I've tried to stitch this image, I don't even get this. Lightroom in many cases will just simply tell me it won't work. It just gives me a text error message and that's it. In this case, it says seven of the 15 images were able to be used. I don't know why it gives me different results on different tries but the end result is the same, no matter what, it always fails. So let's cancel this. And what I've done is I've already exported these images over into a folder of TIFF files. And what I wanna do is use these TIFF files with a program called PT GUI Pro. This is a piece of software whose entire purpose for existence is to make panoramas, and it's very, very good. Now it has a whole lot of options, and I know it looks super intimidating, and that's the way I felt the first time but thankfully there's actually not much you need to do. If you know where to look, there's only a couple of quick steps and it works really well. So let's take a look. We need to first grab these images. So I'm just gonna select everything, drag and drop them over to PT GUI Pro. It's gonna start importing these. I can already jump ahead and click on align images and let it know, go ahead and start working on this. So it's just starting to assemble and make sense of all these images. And in far less time than Lightroom, it's already spit out a result that obviously is going to work. I mean, this is, this is not the way I want the image to look. We need to warp it a bit, but obviously it's stitching together in a pretty high quality way. So we need to do a few things. One, I wanna get rid of the distortion, like these bowed foreground lines. And two, I don't wanna leave any gaps on the edges, at least nothing I can't fill in the end. It needs to be something manageable, and this is not it. So what we can do is play with different projections. And that's what these options are right here. We can choose from a cylindrical projection or spherical. And this spherical option is really what I should be playing with because I'm doing a multi-row panorama. And you can see that's gotten quite a bit better, but it's not perfect. If I click on this dropdown, there's a bunch of different choices here. And the ones I tend to like are this transverse vedutismo, which does a pretty good job. You can see it's Starting to look interesting, if you can imagine chopping off these edges here. And ignore these red lines. This is just showing the individual contribution of the images. If I were to turn on the image numbers here, you can see that like image 11 is this little zone here and 10 is some other portion, but it ends up looking like some kind of weird geography lesson. So um, there is some way to turn these off. I forget what it is, but if you don't hover over, you don't see that. So, so this is one option that can work really well. The other option that I like quite a bit is the rectilinear and we click on that, that looks really good. Look at these foreground lines. They are nice and straight, just the way I want them. So I'm gonna work with this projection and what I wanna do is fill out the edges so I don't have the blank here and watch out for things like this little gap at the top. The way that you fill this out is you just grab these little sliders and that will let you choose where things are getting kind of cropped. So as I bring this in, it's starting to throw away some of the top and the bottom and I'm just getting a cleaner result. I can do the same thing horizontally and start cropping out the edges to get rid of those areas of missing pixels. And that's looking pretty darn good. Now, I think it's still too tall. I don't need 
all this extra information here. So I am going to shrink it down a bit, just stretch it a little bit vertically, something like that, being very careful to think about edge control and where these lines end. So maybe move that a little bit. And I wouldn't mind if this viewing point here was a little closer to the center, kind of bring the viewer's eyes to something like that. So that is helpful. And I've, of course, lost some of that top there. So everything's a little bit of a trade-off. And I'm going to go to something more like this. I think that's going to be pretty engaging. And then just watching my edges here to try and make sure I get rid of that little bit of a gap there. So I'm just looking at the corners, see things look all right. And see this is not aligning the same way as this. So I'd like to rotate this a bit. And this is not something I would normally do, but if you do need to rotate it, in the options on the right here, you get this little drawer you click on to bring out these options. One of them is this uh, transform and we can just choose the roll. And I don't know if it's positive or minus, but we can just put in 0.1 roll and click apply. And you can see it's moving in the correct direction. And every time I apply it, it's just gonna apply that same amount of rotation. So I'm just looking to see that this little line and this little line over here, feel like they're kind of clicking about the same way. That looks like that's pretty well balanced in the corners. The bottom looks pretty decent to me. I could still play with a little bit of stuff in the vertical orientation here and see if I want to crop this any differently. If I open it up and pull in another row up top there. Um, yeah, I'll go with that. We'll give it a little bit more breathing room like this. So that's looking really good. And I think we can export this. So what we need to do is go back to that other window we started in. And this is the part that just threw me in circles the first time I used the program because there's no file like save. Like how do you save your image? You can save the project. But how do you actually export the image? Well, it turns out you want to go to Tools, Main Window, which I think is kind of a strange choice. It is what it is, but this is where all the key things happen. And you can ignore all this stuff. I and mean, there are just crazy options in here for all sorts of stuff you can do to this image. If you want to go crazy on alignment, go for it. If you want to throw really bad quality inputs, go for it. But if you give it good quality inputs, you don't need to do this stuff. You can skip all the way to the bottom and we can just export this thing. Now, the first time you're using this, you're going to want to make sure you tell it you want a TIFF because it'll be defaulting to a JPEG. So just go set it to a TIFF. Make sure you click and change it from 8 to 16 bits. And then the output should just be the blended panorama. You can export the other options if you want to do some advanced work, but this is really all you need. It should be great. And then I would just say to use your source image color space if possible, and then just choose your, your backup which could be something like Adobe RGB. Now you only need to do this one time because you can go up to file, make default. And now I've just told it, hey, every time I create a new project, use the same settings. So it, it now knows what I want. And all you have to do is click create panorama. This is the key button. This is how you export. And this is what I spent so much time looking for, but that's it. So once we do that, you can see it's already starting to create a panorama here in our folder. And we just need to give it a little bit of time to complete. So I'll let that speed up. And it's done. And I'm just going to go double click on this file to open it up in Photoshop where we can complete this image. And I have a vision of doing a couple of things to this image. I'd like this foreground to be a little bit less strong and I'd like the top to be stronger. And what I'm thinking is I want to create the appearance of the sun poking through the skylight and casting rays of light into this scene. And thankfully, there's a really good way of doing that. Let's first make this a smart object by right clicking and choosing convert to smart object so that whatever we do to it is non-destructive, which will give us the ability to make further changes to our filtering. And now I'm going to go up to filter and I'm going to go to Skylum software Luminar 4. This is the other key piece of software I'm using for this edit is Luminar because it has this light ray filter that I think is just incredible. So Luminar is a very full featured plugin, all sorts of different options here. All I'm going to do is skip right to the more advanced stuff here on the creative section. And then we go to sun rays. This is the effect that I want to add. And what we want to do is bring up the amount so you can see the effect. And this is the kind of thing it's going to do to your image. It's going to create this simulated effect of light streaming through the image. And right now it's kind of gibberish because why would light be poking through from within the building? I want the light to come from here. So what we do is click on place sun center. And now you see this little white dot. That's our sun center. We can move it wherever we want it to be. It just kind of follows things 
And I'm thinking something like right here looks pretty cool. I love these rays of light coming through. Now you can play with the sun ray length, all sorts of options, get exactly what you want. The overall look is going to determine whether it's kind of washed out or more high contrast. I'm thinking something maybe a little bit more contrasty like that. Penetration is just kind of the overall brilliance of the fact. I'm going to double click it, put it back to its defaults. That all looks pretty good. Then there's an advanced settings and you can change things like the number of sun rays to play with and get different looks there. I think fewer is better in my opinion. I'm probably going to diminish some of this in the foreground. I don't want to wash this area out too much. I really like the light rays on the side and I don't want it to be as strong with the down light here. The uh, sun radius, we can use that to kind of control the center, which is this portion right here, or the glow radius. And you see that again around the center there. So as you move it to the right, it's kind of more powerful. And I think the default's fine. So the rest of these I think are probably gonna be great as they are. I'm gonna stick with what's in here. And that's really all I need from Luminar right now. So I'm gonna click apply. And I'm gonna mask out a little bit of what I did here. We've got this white, smart filter mask. And if this mask is blacked out, it will hide that filtering. So this is part of the non-destructive process when working with a smart object is we get this little mask. So I'm gonna hit B for my brush. I've got black as my foreground paint, make my brush a little bit bigger. My flow can be something like 8%. And I just want to dial things back. And that's, whoa, that's going way too fast. I'm not sure why that's quite so strong there, but let's Take a look at our brush settings. The hardness, I'm gonna soften up my brush. I'm gonna bring my flow back down to, uh, let's go with 2%. And now I'm gonna brush this back a little bit here just to kind of soften that up a little bit. And then I'm gonna fade that back. I'm gonna just go double click on my mask. And if I bring the density in, that's assuring a minimum amount. If I bring it all the way to the left, everything goes white again. So I can just bring the density back until I get the kind of look that I want in the middle. I think that looks pretty good. Now, I wouldn't mind playing with making these light rays a little stronger and just see if that's a look that I like. So I can dodge and burn these and I'll just do that in Lumento by clicking on dodge, what a 50% gray pixel layer. And now we need something to help select these rays of light here. And a good way of doing that is the difference button in Lumenzia which is gonna help find areas where the pixels are lighter or darker than their neighboring pixels. It's a very powerful way of extracting light from a scene or grabbing edges. And in the default setting, you can see it's going after edges because it's using a very small radius of comparison. But if we kick that up quite a bit, let's go more towards like 300 pixels. Now we're really getting more of that lighting effect. We're comparing larger sections of the image. And I think that's gonna work really well. So I'm gonna hit cell to convert that into a selection, meaning that everything that's white there is going to be selected. And so now I can paint through that selection just on the light rays. I'm gonna hit B for my brush and I'm gonna take my flow all the way down to 1%, use a little bit smaller brush, and I can paint right over these light rays without fear of spilling over the edges because I've got that selection to help guide me as I work. And so I'm just gonna kind of roughly paint over these areas and increase the strength of a couple of these light rays that I think really add atmosphere to the scene. And let's just take a look from before to after. You see how that just strengthens that up a little bit? It's a nice little effect. And if we were to just take a look at this on its own, I can click on Dodge to visualize the selected layer. You see the pattern that's resulting here. It's just showing us the light that we're adding to the scene. So I think that looks good. I'm gonna hit Command D to deselect. I think I'm done with that. The last thing I said is I want to soften up the light in the foreground a little bit. And a good way of doing that would be to add a brightness contrast layer. You can open this up, bring down the brightness a little bit, and then I just need to target it to the highlights. And we can do that by using a blend if. If I shift click on the L button in Lumenzia, we get a blend if lights 1.5. So now it's darkening, but just in areas of highlight. And you can see how that softens up those stairs a little bit. I don't necessarily need to go as much. Maybe pull that back a little bit. And I just need to target it to the bottom of the image. Good way of doing that is we can alt click for a black mask and then hit G for our gradient tool, just using the regular black and white gradient in Photoshop. Click and drag down, which will give us a gradient over that foreground. You can see that we've got this gradient now. 
and just see how we've done there. Just, just soften that up a little bit, take a little bit of that light off the stairs and help the viewer's eyes show up above. So that should give you a good sense of the power of PT GUI. And now watch these videos to learn more about making great panoramas.